master on mathematics uh, in our time. Um, I have a few introductory remarks. Um, so this is uh, the first in a series of lecturing uh, of a series of lectures honoring one of our former uh, colleagues, uh, Dale Coe. The goal of these lectures is to communicate the importance of mathematics and the impact on science, technology, and society. If you are interested in uh, lectures like this, please contact us uh, through our website. Uh, you can also send an email to mathevans at ncsu.edu. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, Don Sari, I would like to welcome uh, a few special guests uh, that we have with us today. And I will also tell you a little bit about Jayoko. First of all, I would like to welcome the Gordon family, who spearheaded the efforts to start the Mathematics Lecture Series. Of course, I would also like to welcome the members of the Co family, whom are with us today. First of all, Jayoko's wife. Um, uh, Mrs. Donico, his daughters Patricia Friedman and Bernaco, and with her husband Steve, uh, Steve Carmen. And last but not least, there was son James Go with his son David, who is currently a uh, student at NC State. You can see uh, many more details about Jail's life on the back side of your program, and I will give a very brief summary. He arrived at NC State in 1964 when he joined the mathematics department uh, after getting his PhD. Uh, during his long career at NC State, he has authored many papers, uh, written a book, served as a member for 11 PhD students, and his lifelong commitment to education was really his cardinal feature of his tenure at NC State. He taught and influenced thousands and thousands of students over the course of his career until his retirement in 2004. He continued to teach part-time and actively uh, participate in the research and educational activities of the department until the time of his death in 2009. His generous spirit, powerful intellect, and profound integrity remains an inspiration to his friends, family, and colleagues. Our speaker today is uh, Don Sari, who holds a distinguished professorship at the University of California, Irvine. Don is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Guggenheim Fellow, the past chair of the US National Committee of Mathematics, chair of the US delegation to the 2002 General Assembly of the International Mathematical Union, and a member of several National Research Council committees, including the Math Sciences Education Board. Don is particularly proud of his numerous teaching awards, including being selected twice by students as most influential professors. Don Sari's research has spanned many areas, from the mathematics of elections and other applications of mathematics in social sciences to the end of the program. Today, he will speak about mathematics in the mystery of dark matter. So let me welcome Don Sari. Thank you, thank you very much. See my backyard? <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's not. That's uh, actually the, uh, between France and uh, Switzerland. Um, what I want to do, it's, it's a true delight to be invited to be back here. I was here a couple of years ago. It's a true delight to be back, particularly to be the inaugural speaker of this lecture series. This uh, is, you know, Professor Bowles, and a uh, very distinguished career. And if you read the back, I encourage you to read the back of that uh, form there to see what he's done. What he's done is, uh, about the lecture series, extends and continues what he wanted to do, and that is to try to put forward the importance of mathematics. Now, to give you a little indication about the importance of, like, oh boy, a senior in front of Roll Harvest uh, Suisse, <laughs> uh, to the, 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 get across the idea of the importance of mathematics, I can get across it by just simply pointing out that, look, oh, I'm going to be talking about dark matter. I am also a member of the economics department, and I am a director of the Institute of Behavioral Sciences. Mathematics, mathematics plays a crucial role in all of these. Now, 
It's standard when you were a kid, right? It was standard to get your age. It was standard for your parents to say that no, you need to know mathematics to understand these various areas. And you were probably thinking about the arithmetic and all the other types of things that you had to do. But I'm going to try to get across to you today that what mathematics does is mathematics creates conceptual insights into areas. It gives us new insights into areas that we haven't had before. And that's where a lot of power comes from. Now, I'll talk about behavioral sciences and economics a little bit tomorrow, but today I'm going to speak about dark matter. And the first question, of course, is what is that mysterious thing called dark matter? I'm sure most of you have no idea. You read about it. We had that last uh, shuttle that went up to the space station, and what did they have? What they did is they had a $1.5 billion experiment to try to find dark matter, and they haven't found it. And we've had all kinds of it. But what is it? Secondly, does it constitute as much of the universe as we claim it does? And how much is it? I don't know. And then thirdly, what does it have to do with mathematics? And that's probably one of the main themes that I'm going to have here. Now, let me warn you, what I'm going to say is controversial. Not to mathematicians. <coughs> mathematicians who have seen their results all accept it uh, very uh, readily. And physicists, but astronomers, uh, well, we find it a little controversial. And we might see some of that here. So, why am I interested in this area? It was my first area. It's my first academic love. And we all know that first love, right? That first love is just something else. And uh, my first academic love was mathematics of uh, the uh, of astronomy. It's it, it intriguing. Now, if we think about the history of this area, uh, we were the ancient astrologers. Uh, we think about the shepherds and the wandering tribes of hunters, all looking up at the skies, using the skies as a way to try to determine where we're headed and what's going on. And we look at the Americans. Without question, without question, this is the world's oldest profession. <laughs> Well, you know, I had that same reaction when I said this before. And so I asked around and said, why are you laughing? And they told me that, well, quite frankly, the world's oldest profession has something to do with economics. <laughs> <laughs> ah, none of my colleagues tell me about that. <laughs> so if it's not the world's oldest profession, at least it's the world's second oldest profession. <laughs> and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the world's second oldest profession as we get through here. Now, where did dark matter start? It started with this guy right here, Zwicky, professor at Caltech, 1933. And, when he's, and it also involves this guy right here, Isaac Newton. Combination of the two. Now, what does Zwicky do? Zwicky was looking at clusters of galaxies. I'm going to talk about galaxies. But he was talking about clusters of galaxies, and he was trying to measure the mass, velocity, and everything else. And what he did is there was a problem he discovered. He determined the mass of the different galaxies, the luminosity, the uh, rotational velocities, and everything. And then, of course, you have to pull them all together with Newton's law. And it didn't fit. They did not agree. Ouch. Big time profit. And so what we had to do is uh, try to find out what we need for agreement. And for agreement, we needed much, much more mass. How much more mass do you ask? Well, because if we don't have much more mass, this, this theory is gone. This theory is gone. And there are people, by the way, who believe that Newton is wrong. Uh, Milgram in Israel uh, has a theory that says Newton's law is good, pretty really close, but when you go far, the force law changes and it becomes not the inverse square, it becomes the inverse force law. Uh, but uh, they have much, much more mass to keep his laws. How much more mass? A lot. According to NASA, everything we see up there, this little human all the stars, all the planets, it accounts for 
only 5% of what's up there. Only 5% of what's in the universe. 95% of the universe, we don't know where it came from. We have no idea. That's a lot. And so what we have to do is try to find it out. If we can find uh, 95%, you know, it's unobservable. 95% of the universe is not observable. Then it must consist of yeah, dark matter. We, we can't, can't see the screen. And that's where dark matter comes from. We're wondering if we can get some shots on that. Now, uh, does it exist? Are you controlling? Yeah, just where does it exist? Well, let's see. Keep going. So Whitney put forth an idea back in 1933. And what was Whitney saying? He said, let's look at an agent. Let's use that sky by the name of Einstein's his theory. And let's look at an you know, RO galaxy. And see the light curve in this side and the light curve in this side. That's gravitational density. And it curves only if there's enough mass in there. And so what we do is we find that there's potentially reason to believe that there's a lot of dark matter out there. So what happens is that might save good old classic ideas. Now what we have then, this is from catching that distance a little closer. Right, they have here is a picture. This is a, a picture of a dark matter halo. And we have to have dark matter to see from my lecture, if I forget to tell you at the end, ask me. But we expect that there's a large amount of dark matter on top. This already goes back to uh, Oscar commentary, uh, to Peebles back in the early 70s. Okay? And here's a picture of what we think there are two galaxies colliding. Maybe that is dark matter. So that's what we have. Okay? Now what we have is the next question. And that is, uh, how much mass, uh, how, do we, how, much, uh, uh, how is the amount of mass computed? If we're saying there's not enough mass, how do we compute the amount of mass? Well, let's see. Here's, let's take a very simple case. How do you pay find the mass of the sun? Well, an obvious approach would be to put it on the scale. <laughs> Except there's a problem here. You know, it's hotter than Hades <laughs> over there. And uh, intensity. I mean, the only way you could do this is to do it late at night. <laughs> And as one of my graduate students explained to me, if we did it late at night, we wouldn't be able to see what the scale said. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't do that approach. <laughs> so what are we going to do? Well, the answer is given by this uh, young girl right here. And look at her eyes. Oh, my God. You know why her eyes are wide open? Here's with me, two of you had a wait. Look what she's doing. She's leaving this way. Ah. Now, suppose I take this weight right here. <laughs> and suppose I put it on a thread. I'm going to take this weight, and I'm going to put it on a thread, and I'm going to spin it. And what's going to happen? All the people on here are going to start begging, ducking. <laughs> Why? We know that there is a relationship between the strength of the string and the rotational velocity. We learned it as a kid when we were spinning things around. And so what we have then is exactly what you explained by her is that there is restriction. And in astronomy, where does that strength of the string come from? The strength of the string comes from the gravitational pull by Newton's law. And it comes from the mass of the sun. Because the mass of the sun, remember we have it's the inverse square law is the mass of the two objects and the distance between them squared and the denominator. And so the mass of the sun, the gravitational attractions is holding that in, even if it's Okay? And so what we do then is we end up with the following equation. Now this equation right here, this equation right here is the gravitational pull where it's trying to suck the sun into the, uh, time into the sun. So this is the inverse square force law. And this term right here is, well, every time you go into the carnival, you know those crazy law rides on the carnival? 
you get into something and it spins around and a floor disappears underneath you and you don't fall through because you're spinning around so fast. Well, this is the spinning effect right here. And really, zero angular velocity, if the planet is going in a rotational, you know, circular velocity, what happens is these two things are equal. And since the mass of the star or a planet is right here, I can cancel it out. Okay? And so that's where it comes from. But really, that's the amount of that equation for it. Really, the whole idea is this right here. It's the whole idea. is that we have to measure the rotation, rotation, as I stated, it's given by this, and the strength of the string, and the two have to equate. And that's where it comes from. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, now what happens is, <coughs> so let's find out with Newton's law. Find out what is the mass of the sun. There is the equation I just showed you. I just collect, here's the mass of the sun, and I just collect terms on the other side. So to find the mass, this is the gravitational constant. And it is a constant that has been computed and computed and computed. We know it right well. So what is the mass of the sun? Well, we take the Earth. We're 92 million miles away. Okay, 92 million. Figure that out. That's the radius. Now, if you have a radius, we know 2 pi r, right, from high school, grade school, arithmetic. So we know the circumference. So it's 2 pi times 92 million so is the distance it has to go in one year. We take that and we square it. So we have a numerator and that divided by that constant and that gives you the mass of the sun. Okay? Very, very clever. Man, amazingly imaginative way of finding the sun. Now, we've got a problem. And the problem is, could the sun mass estimates change with the planet? I mean, let's look at Saturn. Saturn is almost nine times as far away from the sun as we are. So that's going to give me one heck of a big number up here. And to make the mass of the sun not change, because the planets are minuscule, to make the mass of the sun not change, then this right here, rotational velocity, has to be one third. <coughs> so I have nine times one nine. That's what I have to have. And does that is that true? And in fact, it is. Kepler, Kepler's law, third law, says that the rotation, the farther out you go, the farther out you go, the slower the planets are going. But he says more than the farther out you go, the planets are slowing down. What he is saying is how fast they are slowing down. And here is the uh, here is the expression. So here's the Earth, and here's Saturn about nine times as far. Here's the Earth about thirty, and here's Saturn about ten. And so what happens is it fits up exactly what you need. In fact, a way of looking at Kepler's third law. A way of looking at Kepler's third law is that this term right here is going to be a constant. And so a way of looking at Kepler's third law is that the planets behave just nicely so that the mass of the sun doesn't change. So that the mass of the sun stays safe. Okay? And so what we are is we're safe. <laughs> well, the mass of the sun stays the same. But suppose it didn't. Let's suppose the mass of, as we measure it from different planets, the mass of the sun change. Let, let, let's, let's, let's have a story to see how it would happen. Let's have a fish story. We all have a fish story. You catch a fish, you go home, and you tell your friends about how big it was. Actually, when they weigh it, it's much smaller. Uh, well, uh, you know, it, uh, it, uh, it dried up <laughs> or something when you came home. But suppose the story goes the other way. Suppose you caught this fish, you got the weight, you got home, and it now weighs three times as much as when you got it. Huh? Something happened in between. How did the weight jump? That's a mystery then. If it, 
if what happens is this is what it should be, and it lays weights much more, but something happened in between. Well, this right here, say the same thing. Suppose for each planet, suppose the mass of the sun did grow rapidly. We know it doesn't, but suppose the estimates did grow. Just like in the story right here, what would we say? We'd say that what did have something in between happen? And that something, what we would do is we would call it dark matter, because we can't see it, so it would be dark matter. So that, in some sense, is why we have dark matter. Or why we believe there's dark matter. I don't know if there is or not. We'll find and it doesn't happen for the solar system, but let's see what happens in galaxies. Okay? So now I'm in a galaxy situation. All right. In a galaxy, what happens is that, um, uh, that uh, in astrophysics, we have to solve the n y problem if we want to have n word solutions. Well, Newton was very nice. He solved the two bottom problem. If our universe consists of only two particles, the sun and the earth, no moon, no sun, no, I mean, no uh, <coughs> Mars, Venus, or anything else, just a two bottom problem, he found an analytic solution. And then he went on to other parts of physics. We haven't been able to solve the three body problem, or the four body problem, or the five body problem, or the n body problem at all since then. So we have a difficulty. When are the n years, the number of bodies, is the billions body problem, or maybe 10 billion bodies. We want to know what happens when 10 billion bodies are going around and around and around. Well, we don't want to do it. And so, in a very clever way, they say, let's look at star soup. Now, what's star soup? Star soup is that we have so many planets up there and stars and everything, let's just assume that it's a continuous conglomerate of some sort. So we have a continuous approximation. Okay. And then what are we going to do is we use something called Newton's first and second laws. And I'm going to go, I'll walk you through what they are. All right. What we have is, uh, there's my star. <coughs> all the planets symmetrically. I'm talking about the symmetric situation. So all the planets are in here. We're going to assume it's a star suit, that it's just one continuous clock. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a particle up there. And what am I going to do in that particle? I'm going to ask, what is the, uh, what's the gravitational force? What oh, happens? That that's not. What happens is the story uh, <clears throat> the story is much like this right here. Now I'm going to use this story right here of a guy shooting a balloon. See? Equal distance. No? The balance, if he has it nicely balanced, that arrow is going to go off in a nice direction. But suppose he doesn't have it nicely balanced. Suppose this is the situation he has, where you've got more tension here than you have here. What's going to happen? Maybe I'll get it in the forehead or call it angle, but it's not going to go straight. And so really the idea is just this one right here, that if I have two forces that are nicely balanced, then the arrow's going to go in a straight direction. All right? And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to take a particle and I'm going to find another particle on the side so they're equally balanced. So it looks just like the bow screen. And then what happens is just like the arrow, it's going to go straight down. It's going to cancel just like here. It's going to go straight up. And I want to do this for every particle. And what happens then is I can treat the whole mess as though it were just a big blob with all that mass at the center. So this is for Newton's law. that allows us to take all the particles in a big, big object and to say it's just as though it's a blob. And it's just a bow and arrow story. Nothing more than that. And then what he did is he said, well, what if we have a, a circle going around here? A ring going around here? And we're similar stories. And to get the exact details, take calculus, uh, uh, integral calculus to or where you have line inputs. And you will find that force coming from this right here on here is zero. 
And so what we have then, it's that if for a star soup, they have a special box that can view the attraction as being all based at the center, and the outside body is on the back. And once you do this, and there's a beautiful description of this, it's Dr. Main's book on the dynamics of astrophysics. Uh, once you have this, you get that is at radius r, distance r from the center of the galaxy. This right here is the mass of the galaxy. This is what they get. Okay, beautiful. All we need now, in other words, what it is, is that's the mass. The mass that they predict is the mass. The mass that they predict there is the mass to keep this thing from not flying off. It's the strength of the pull. If that mass isn't strong enough, what does that say? It says that this different thing is going to put do that and the roll number 13, watch out. So I'm lucky. Here it goes. Okay. And that's what it will look like. All right. So let's, let, let's review. What we have then is here's the equation. So all we need are the observations to find what's the mass. And here comes the work of Vera, Rubin, and, uh, and Ford. Beautiful work. Absolutely beautiful work. What she did is she observed galaxy after galaxy to try to find out how fast are the particles rotating, you know, that's spinning, that's the object that's spinning, so you can find out. And how fast are they spinning? And what did she <coughs> discover? That's what she expected, right? She expected to decline. It didn't. <coughs> Instead, it looked like that. There's one, two, three, four galaxies right there. Look what they did. Almost a straight line growth at the beginning. And then they, instead of decreasing, they stay essentially a constant or even slightly increase. Well, a very important question to ask there is, so what? <laughs> All right, and the answer is that when I take these estimates, and put it in here, since this is a constant, I plug it into this equation, that's almost a constant, it says that the total mass is going to keep growing like a constant times the distance from the center of the galaxy. That's the best estimates we have. All right. And what they have is that's fine, except that the observed mass is much, much, much smaller. And so what we get then up to is that we need more and more mass to understand why those particles aren't flying off. Remember, I keep using that thing, spinning the thing. We don't have enough mass that things will shoot out. And so the issue is, why aren't our galaxies dissipating? Why aren't we losing? And why don't we have huge instability? And that's the question of dark matter. Okay? In other words, what is dark matter? And this is a very important comment right here, because we're going to come back to this uh, throughout the lecture. Really, dark matter is the difference between a mathematical prediction and the observed mass. That is what is dark matter. It's the difference between what we predict and what we observe. Okay? Now, what is dark matter? How much is there? Well, you know, I'm also in the philosophy of science at UCLA. And so, on the philosophy of science, I went over and talked to, uh, uh, you know, a lot of history to some of the philosophers. And I talked to the philosopher Dennis. And what Dennis told me was, <laughs> lots of things are invisible, but we just don't know how many because we just can't see them. <laughs> And uh, so that's the problem with dark matter. So what keeps the galaxies good? Uh, so the issue now is a problem. I showed you how they compute the mass. They use star soup. And then from the star soup, what they do is they use that bow and arrow to try to get the force. From the force, what do they do is they say, well, here's what the mass has to be. They compute this. And what they do is what keeps it from flying off. There is a flying off. If we don't have enough mass, that thing's going to fly off and it's going to hit a retina shot. All right. 
So let's go back to the story and look at it from a mathematical perspective and see if mathematics could offer something else. Well, that was the story we had. But suppose I have another uh, story. Suppose I have a particle right there. If I have a particle nearby, you know what's going to happen with Newton's equations of motion. They're going to be attracting each other. And in fact, if this red one, by being nearer, uh, uh, you know, closer to the center and going faster, if it's attracting the gray one, what's it doing? It's pulling it along. So therefore, the law of attraction is not an attraction; it's an attraction. Well, you're not off by much. Or are we? The next question is if I have another. Maybe this one's pulling this one, and this one's pulling this one, and we pull them all around. Maybe what we're doing is we're having that effect rather than the other one, which we talked about. If that's the case, then maybe we have something much like Winslow Homer's snapping the whip. This is where the people are hanging on right here, the center of the galaxy. They're each holding themselves, and by running and holding on to each other, they can go across at much faster speed than they could run on their own. And this is the old standing of the whip uh, game. And a more modern version uh, is uh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> but here is an astronomical version. And isn't that what it looks like? Doesn't it look pretty much like they're pulling each other around? You look at any of the galaxy type things, particularly the, the spherical uh, galaxies, the ones where they are, I mean, the black galaxies, the ones that we're talking about dark matter. And they have a lot of <coughs> And so maybe this story right here, instead of this story, maybe this is the story we have. All right. Well, it's easy to say, hey, I got a story. Want to hear my story? Okay. That isn't going to get you anywhere. You got to prove that he makes a difference. And so when I talked about this uh, with some uh, astrophysicists at Princeton, they said, Don, makes, makes a good story. <laughs> but, uh, why don't you find an analytic solution for us? <laughs> no, we only have two body problems. But make an analytic solution. Maybe if you could find a billion body problem that has that where the predictions and the mass are off, maybe 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 you've got something. That was not over, so I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what we have, and now I so I have to create an analytic solution. And how I'm going to do this is for something called a central configuration. And I think you'll find this fascinating on this one. A central configuration is where you place the particles appropriately. Okay? So that for each particle, its position from the center of mass lines up with its acceleration with the same fudge factor, the same constant all the way along the line. Central configurations play a huge, huge role in trying to understand the evolution of the universe, understanding the behavior of uh, uh, the building and body problems and everything else. And in fact, here is an example. An equilateral triangle. If you put the particles in the equilateral triangle, it will form a central configuration for any masses. Independent of the any masses. This was discovered by Lagrange in about 17 80s. And around 1914, the German astronomer Wolf decided to this exist. And so he looked at the Sun, Jupiter, and where do you know? He found some Trojan asteroids at the surface of equilateral time. These are the Trojan asteroids. And the wonderful thing about a central configuration is that it gives the right velocity. <coughs> It keeps that configuration forever. It just keeps rotating forever. And so what we have here is it just keeps rotating. So what did I do is I took as many lines as you would like, just make the angles between them the same. You want 5,000 lines? Go ahead. 5,000 lines. I'm not going to draw a picture of 5,000 lines. It takes long enough to draw this picture. <laughs> then what happens is I draw the distance. And I draw a circle, and every time the circle crosses one of these lines, 
I put the same mass, mass one, 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 mass one. Go to the second circle. Mass two, mass two, mass two, mass two, etc. Third circle, mass three, four circle, fifth circle, as many circles as you would like. And by use of mathematics, you can show that I can adjust the radii of these circles. And by use of uh, fixed point terms, etc., so that I get a central configuration, a configuration which will remain the same shape from there. So I have an inbound. So there it goes. It's going to have the same. So let's take a look. How fast is this moving relative to this fellow? Well, it's much like in baseball, right? You're getting a uh, very bonds on steroids when you're uh, getting that thing. At the very, you know, get that, you get the sweet spot. You get the very tip of the bat. And you know, this is right, both sides, of course, for reasons. Uh, but as you get this thing right here, at the very tip, it's going at its fastest speed. The farther out, the faster it's going. Or tennis. Your arms moving at the tennis racket, at the tip is moving much faster. And so, really, what's happening here then is that. The rotational velocity is the same constant, just depends on how far out you go. And so when I substitute that inside here, what I get is going to be a mass prediction for my analytic and billion body problem. Right? It doesn't matter how many bodies you want. I can create a solution. And so then what happens is I can now make predictions. Because I have an analytic <coughs> solution. With an analytic solution, what can I do is I know where the true mass is. I made the solution. I know what the mass is. So I made an example where the mass is 20 units. Now suppose the predicted value is, well, is 140. Wow! I'd be off by a multiple of 7. But to tell you folks, in astronomical circles, the multiple of seven is very is, is not negligible because of what they're doing. But it's instead what the real mass was. So here is the true mass, and by use of what the astronomers are using, here is the predicted mass. So the predicted mass, by using their method, is off by a multiple of seven trillion trillions. That's a lot, folks. <laughs> That's a lot. Particularly when you realize that dark matter is the predicted value, and if the predicted value is off a lot of what there actually is, minus the unknown mass, then the numbers are going to get closer together, much, much closer together. Now, what happens here is that not all estimates are that bad off. Some are worse. You tell me how many multiples you wanted to be off, and I'll create an analytic solution, and I'll create something that will be off that many estimates. No problem. That's very easy. Uh, but some of them are only well, multiples of like 10,000 or something like that, or multiples of 100 or something like that. And so what we have then, the reason for this is that Newton's first and second laws are not applicable. Mathematics now shows that those laws that we've been using to simplify to approximate <coughs> these approximation methods, that those laws are not applicable for discrete bodies. And really the message is to beware. Everything can go wrong with yeah. some of these things, and do including a lot of the estimates which, which, which we've had. All right, so we can expect errors and new kinds of results. Okay, so now, that's because things are pulling each other along. Okay, I got this result. I show that the, at the very, very minimum, what does this result say? At the very minimum, it says that the method that the astronomers are using can, uh, cannot be relied upon. At the very minimum, it says that this method has to have certain caveats, has to have certain conditions. What are they? We don't know. We have no idea. Now, the astronomers regularly say that we don't just use that equation. 
primarily the exact equation. That's the equation in almost all of the papers, all the papers that I have seen. But what happens is they do use other approaches. But this critical approach which they're using does give highly unrealistic and predictions. If it gives unrealistic predictions, then the predicted mass is way off from the actual mass. And so there's nowhere near as much current matter. So what the astronomers have been asking, well, can you use this to be able to uh, explain to us then what's going on with the rotation velocity curves? Remember those curves I showed you? Can you show me what's going wrong on there? And how can I understand it? Well, let's take a look and see what we have to use. We're talking about rotations, aren't we? If I'm talking about rotations, I have to use something called the angular momentum. Never mind this equation. Mathematicians and physicists in here say, oh, yeah, that's the angular momentum. Uh, but for the others will say, oh, that's a fun looking equation. And so let me just tell you what it is. It's a measure of how fast each particle is rotating. It's a measure of the rotation momentum. And what I'm doing is I'm adding up all of the rotational effect of all the bodies. <clears throat> An amazing fact of machining mechanics. It's, you know, it's a partial solution. We can't get the full solution, so we write a lot of partial solutions. It's a partial solution. It says that the summation of all these rotations is equal to a constant. That's what it says. Okay, well, if it's equal to a constant, and some are going slower and some are going faster. So let's see how I get out of it. So I use the angular momentum. I use observations, primarily that of uh, Vera Rubin. And by the way, Vera Rubin's uh, uh, son, Carl Rubin, has his office right next to mine in the math department at UCLA. And uh, I use stability assumptions. The virial thing. What's the virial thing? I'm willing to bet most of you don't know. But I'll just give you a brief idea. They say that the universe, the galaxies, are not expanding by much. They stay pretty close to the it, The way they usually say it, it's a constant, but that's false. So what they do is uh, they're saying that it doesn't change too much. And by use of mathematics, you can find out what's happening to the velocities. What are all the velocities doing? And by use of all of these type of things, we can now explain that curve in all its parts. This is what's going to give me a tool. That's what's going to give me something about the masses. This is, in some sense, an average rotation. Some are going faster, some are going smaller. And so what it does is it defines what I call, and what I talk about an imaginative choice of words. I call it the angular momentum line. The angular momentum. Uh, you can see why mathematicians are not novels. Okay? And really what happens with this angular momentum line it's that it bounces off this region and that region. The weighted sum over here has to equal the weighted sum over here. So what's the weighted sum? The weighted sum is the mass of the star times the distance down here. And it is the mass of the star times the distance up here. Look how big these distances are here. If this side has to equal that side, then the masses have better be very, very small. <coughs> Much smaller than what they say from any other region. And in fact, that's what you get. Uh, the fact that you get this out of the variable theorem is true. Actually, this line is too crooked. It should be a little bit more straighter, making this region even smaller. So what does it tell you? By use of mathematics, it says that the line that's going up there, that they've got heavy masses, then the other particles have to be close to that line. They have to be close to that line so that the consistency won't be too large. And it says also, as we've already gone through, that the other distances must be a heavy curve, a rotational curve. And that explains for the first time that I have been able to find why these rotational curves have to start off with straight lines that had not been known before. 
you know, it's just that's what happens in, in galaxies. But here it just says, no, that's what you have to expand. And also, because these particles, distances right here, are very, very large, these masses have to be small, the discrete bodies must be much, much smaller than predicted. So small that they coincide with what we have for other methods. There's no longer gross uh, dis uh, distinctions or gross contradictions. They are all compatible, is what you get. And so really what we have is what's my key about this. It pops Okay. So what's my take on this? The first question is, uh, does dark matter exist? And it most surely does. I mean, after all, what happens is just before I came here, the night before, my wife reminded me that there's some dark matter in the corner of our garage, and she asked me that I better get it all before I leave, or else <laughs> I'll be in trouble when I get home. <laughs> so yeah, there's dark matter. But if you take a look at the huge, huge, huge yeah, expansion of our universe, of course there has to be something called dark matter. Something that we don't understand. I didn't study it in the But is there as much as we said? No. Because it contradicts Newton's laws of motion. Yeah, uh, so before, remember, we did all of these things to try to preserve Newton's laws? Where are we now? Now we are at the other way around, that you have to accept that the masses are much, much smaller if you want to believe in Newton. It's not the other way that they have. So if you believe in Newton, you have to believe that the amount of mass is much smaller. Not clear how much, but you know it's much, much smaller. And this is an important take home message. A couple. One of them is referred to the purpose of this lecture series. And that is mathematics can make not computation, but also conceptual differences in how we view the world, the universe these days, and how we do uh, other things. Uh, we, uh, and, and also the discrete system is different. These are answers that challenge the usual assertions and they explain their, as I stated also, that this is an example of muscle power that's added to anything by a careful, thoughtful use of mathematics. It will change how we conceive of it. What is possible to do with it? Now, here is a partial commercial. A lot of mathematics came from my book right here. Uh, not the dark matter, but the mathematics that that man just came from here. And with that, I want to thank you very much. Thank well, thank you for a very fascinating lecture. Um, would you mind answering a few questions if I assume the audience has many of them? Questions, everyone? Yeah? Uh, once we isolate dark matter, what might be some uses for it? What would be what? Some uses for it. What could we use it for? Use what? Dark matter. Dark matter. Well, I don't think there's enough of it to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> if we have to buy a whole thing. Uh, and you're asking a very good question. You know, well, I always ask my students in all my classes, whether it's a freshman calculus class or graduate students working with me, what happened? WGAD. You know what that is? Tell me stands for who, G for gives, <laughs> <laughs> which is what you asked also, wasn't it? And it was a, uh, uh, a very, very common statement. One of the reasons that we're going to treat the dark matter is it is Newton's equation, are Newton's equations wrong? Are they or are they not? And before, when we looked at Newton's equations previously, you know, the way uh, the, the star suit approach, they said Newton's equations were wrong. That has big implications in everything you do in outer space and everything else. So they needed to find the dark mass. My approach says no. If we say we don't have the star suit, but we have discrete bodies. Now Newton's equation says we don't have as much dark matter in a galaxy as we have. And so what that does is it preserves, preserves our sense of faith in what we're using for satellites, etc. What I have to do tonight is finish reading on, on, on a report I'm on the committee. Well, three weeks ago, in the International Space, uh, space Station, 
they had to run for their life goals. Gas canister. Because there was something coming by and could hit it. That's the third close call we've had. Now, what do we have? We have 1,100 satellites that need to be protected. GPS, TV, communications, everything else. We have 3 million pieces of chunk out there that are circulating around and wanting to hit something. We've had collisions with shelf on satellites in the Federal Order. And so what we are using is what equations of motion should we be using? So it goes back to the question. We have to understand the fundamental laws of nature. Good question. Same question. I like long questions. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about the model where you use the equilateral triangles, yeah. um, that, um, based on one question, I was telling you um, expanded that to include multiple planets kind of orbiting the sun. Uh, how did you... How did you uh, well, I didn't do that. That, that was working with Ron for the equilateral time. But uh, I guess, can that be expanded um, in the sense that, you know, uh, the planets go in an ellipse instead of... Oh, yeah. Planet. Isn't that so, fascinating? Um, you, any, so I mean, just, I don't exactly say the same, so the equilateral triangles yeah. are quite... Yeah. Very insightful. Yeah, very insightful. Thing. He's essentially saying the following. He's saying, look, oh, he says the equations you're saying for central configuration. It's that each particle thinks it's a separate two-body problem. Right? And that's where he said intuition comes from. And so he's saying, can I get all of the solutions of the two-body problem for that equilateral triangle? And the answer is yes. So in the two-body problem, you can have circular. So I can take that equilateral triangle and I can put it in a circular orbit. In a two-body problem, I can have ellipses. So I can put them so they all are ellipses. In a two-body problem, we have escape velocity. We have parabolic motion that shoots out. And I can put them in equal average time. And in fact, in my work, excellent question. In fact, in my work, I'm trying to find the evolution of the universe, all, all embodied problems, how this being involved. I did exactly what I'm talking about. Very nice question. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, but that's getting into physics. And some of the physical type, since I don't believe we have that much dark matter, I agree with you. Uh, I'm saying that uh, in the galaxies that uh, we don't have that much. Everything I say here, I'm talking about a galaxy that works for clusters of galaxies. And so I think that there's problems there too. But you're right, there's probably the right evolution. Although, just read science. One week they say this, next month they're going to say something different. Um, this is, this, this agrees with everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. As we go out, the masses are going to say, as we go out, farmers, the masses are going to say, and we're in the exact center of it. Yeah. Now, how does that become a straight end-bodied problem? Well, what he's doing is he's talking about, there's all, I mean, one of the nice, nice things about uh, a problem, mathematical astronomy, and a lot of these things is that there's paradox after paradox after paradox. And what we do is the more and more we learn about them, the more we begin to understand why the paradoxes don't work. And that's exactly one of the contributions that's made by mathematics to a large number of other areas, is the more we throw mathematical power out in here, the more we understand them. And but when we're talking in terms of the evolution of the universe by results that I mentioned earlier, uh, we find that it doesn't fall symmetrically like they have in the other versus the other paradoxes. It really are very disjunctive going off in different directions. And in fact, what happens is that results are very compatible with what's absurd. Yes. When you draw a parallel between the ether and the dark matter in terms of our we're, where we were in the early late 1800s, early oh, 1900s, that's, that's, that's a good question. Once, and then Newtonian mechanics. And yeah, what he's, asking, so what he's asking is, he said, you know, and paraphrasing you, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's saying that, oh, yeah, that one of the difficulties in astronomy, one of the advantages in astronomy, you can make all the predictions you want to, and you'll never be around long enough to find out if you're a very good But one of the difficulties in astronomy is that we really have to find an answer, and we don't have any tools to work with. And he pointed out that if 
where they had mice and more of the experiments than some of the others. He said, what we did is we came up with the idea of, well, they kind of contradicted some of the ether type things, and we found that there were some of these things here. And, and he's saying, can we think of dark matter in that same way? That it is a convenient explanation at this stage of our development, where we're now finding ways to get around it. And I, I love that. It's absolutely what I believe is happening. Yeah. Very nice. Yes, we Um, can you clarify what you meant when you said that Newton's first and second laws don't apply in the embodied case? Sure. Uh, Newton's first and second laws hold. They're absolutely hold. There's no question. That's calculus, uh, integral calculus. You go there and, and we'll show you uh, that they hold. But what they're doing is in, in astronomy is they're saying there are too many bodies out there. There's just, you know, continuum. There's just so many. So how are we going to answer that? Yeah, are we going to wait for the mathematicians to solve a billion body problems? If we do, we might have to wait a couple of millennia. And my social security will run out before that. <laughs> and so what happens is we need to find some way Going back to your, your, your question about ether again, we have to find some way to get answers during my lifetime, during my career, so I can get tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we do then is they say that there's so many out there, let's pretend it's like a continuum. And so that's where they have what I call star soup. And then they put in uh, the, the assumptions and they say, well, not these students first and second laws who get this. And uh, what happens is uh, when they do that, uh, we don't get the right equations. And because when you look at these three bodies, a near body particle is going to pull this one out, not letting it go down here. And so that's what happens. Good question. Anyone? How, how are we doing? Okay, anybody else got a question? In fact, you're getting good questions. I love them. Yeah. Yeah, well, Mom, uh, Mom is what he's talking about, MOMP. This is the one from Milgram uh, uh, in Israel. And what has modified the uh, uh, body dynamics. And what he is using, what Milgram uh, uh, is using, is he's using uh, also the uh, star suit. And he's got three papers in the astrophysics journal. And if you haven't seen them, look at them. It shows just beautiful, beautiful analysis. But what he does is, uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> that happens, but that goes again back to the question about either. Uh, science is a large number of steps taken forward to find out what's going on, either they can be falsified or not, and then take the next step. That's, that's the progress of science. And what he did is he said that maybe, just maybe, what happens is the following. Maybe Newton's equations are excellent for nearby interactions. But when we have large interactions, large distance interactions, Maybe instead of the inverse square force law, we have the inverse force law. And with that type of analysis, uh, he's able to uh, get rid of dark matter. Everybody also gets rid of Newton, and that's why a lot of the people in the field don't accept what he has. Um, but, I, but what happens is, uh, if we take a look at uh, what I can do, Newton's inverse square force law, explain it all. And so I don't need it. I'm hoping to meet him. Uh, one of his friends, uh, he and I were at a uh, office uh, two weeks ago, an engineering in Carnegie Mellon. And uh, we could try to make some of it better. Be interesting. Be interesting discussion. Just listen in. <laughs> yeah. So then, out uh, of this one, that, yeah, that's, that's something that wouldn't be falsifiable? Really? No, none of these things are really falsifiable, unfortunately. Um, since the the problem we're dealing with is so vast, and the uh, things that we're measuring are so vast. How big of a role do you think chaos theory plays in that? A lot. And how how um, soon do you think that it would be until we have accurate infra, uh, instruments to measure those uh, distances or masses accurately, so we can have? <laughs> oh, that's a something that's been there are many books on uh, many books on on uh, how the astronomer. Let me tell you, I take my hat off to the astronomers. They're what, what, clerk through people. I mean, what do they have? They look up there, you take a look at the stars that way. What are you going to do? How are you going to measure? I showed them how they measure the mass of the sun. Very clever. And then, well, how are they going to measure some of these other things? We need distances and we need decay. That's how our energy was discovered. And we need all these other type issues. And so uh, they're very, very clever, but they can only get close in essence because of just the complexity of the problem. And they, chaos. 
chaos theory. Well, that's one of my errors. And uh, what happens in chaos theory is that uh, you know nearby orbits start off, but they start separating, and they start doing all their own type of thing. And, you know, we can't figure out. Well, I told you that I was on this space junk, space debris committee to try to find out what's going on. And what do we have? We have well, a piece of junk coming around and gets into, well, it gets into uh, atmosphere. And the orbit starts separating. Sound familiar? It's just got to be telling you. And it keeps coming around to a different area. And so we're now understanding that chaos theory plays a critical role in trying to understand the space junk problem. And it plays a critical role in interstellar, I mean, in interplanetary probes and everything else. It plays a crucial role. So maybe a last question? Okay, last question. You got it. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, what role do computer simulations play in evaluating your theories and other theories about dark matter? What's the status of demonstrating the effect you're talking about in actual simulations? Well, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, what I did is I found the analytic theory of the evolution of the universe back in many years ago, when I was about three years ago. Uh, and uh, what happened is, um, I went to Over Hobok, who just came back from there. And uh, they asked me the question that I study my analytic solution for computer simulations. And uh, my st the statement was, as I did, until I got to the NSF point. And they said, NSF point? Well, when I was trying to integrate to infinity, my NSF point finally ran out. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, what happens is uh, you have to remember that the, um, that the computer simulations are for when we don't have analytic conclusions. And what I've been getting are analytic conclusions. So really, they're used to test for computer simulations. That's what I've about. Maybe not, I didn't understand. This is like the example you gave was an extreme or highly symmetric solution, right? No, no, but at the very at the end where I was going, huh? it's all for anything. Okay. From observations, I can explain any observations. Uh, Jerry Ostraker, who's at Princeton, was asking me, he says, well, are you doing this just for circular? And I said, no, I'm doing anything. He says, well, I'm only doing circular. I said, you have a special case of what I'm doing. So it turns out I do anything. Is it something that has to happen, or it can happen, given the certain... Uh, Jerry, that explains to you that if the observations are what we see, it has to happen. Okay. So, okay, let's thank Don.